How you doing, guys? Welcome to the Naughty Nomad Show again. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Zolo, and today we have a very special guest, Bjorn. He has traveled to every country in the world, and he did it by the age of 29. I'm going to bring him on now. What's the story, yeah. man? How's it going? Great. You? Doing good. I'm just uh, back in Malta enjoying this beautiful heat. And you're in Norway, I believe, right? Yes. Just came back. And just came back from Baghdad, Iraq, where you did a TED yep. Talk. Uh, I did the TED Talk there earlier this year. This time I came to Iraq to do a tour, uh, a one week, uh, seeing the highlights together with 10 Americans and two British. So, um, yeah, one week in the, the heat, uh, 50 degrees almost. And what, what was it? Uh, what's, what's, what's Iraq like? Well, at the moment, um, there's between 45 to 50 degrees. Um, the situation there is going up and down. It's uh, not always completely stable, but uh, we managed to get through the, our itinerary without much much trouble. Uh, I hear it's getting a little bit more tense in the streets in Baghdad at the moment. My friend is still there. But uh, yeah, we did, we did all right. I, I that's I have so many questions for you. It's unbelievable. But uh, I'll start off with uh, your thumbnail uh, that we chose. Uh, it's you covered in blood. <laughs> and I asked yes. you, what what's the story with that? And yeah, you told me that was after killing a goat in Angola and then drenching your body with its... Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> its in blood. 2016. Yeah, I was yeah. Uh, together with uh, 11 others. I was driving a huge van from uh, Europe to South Africa. Um, so during these six months, we were oh, living cool. quite, um, quite simple lives, staying in tents, making food on bonfires, and also killing our own chicken and uh, at this time a goat. So <laughs> there on the beach, we collected this blood and we had this Viking ritual because we called the trip Vikings in Africa. So a blood shower, it had to be. <laughs> it was uh, bring the warm helmets. blood. Yeah, we had a helmet actually. Yeah, we had yeah. to wear it more as a punishment. Uh, so sometimes you had to wear it for a day in Nigeria and the Congos, uh, wearing a huge Viking helmet. It was it was nice. good fun. Oh, we have that yeah. in common because I, I travel as a pirate and you travel as a Viking. So you probably, uh, yeah, exactly. You probably get a lot of attention with that, with that Viking helmet. Absolutely. T t tell me this uh, you said you drove from europe to south africa did you go on the east side or the west side we drove on the west side so the hard side. The... <laughs> yes i know you've been quite a lot in west africa yourself and you probably know how rough it is roads are pretty bad there's a lot of corruption um oh. you know weather rainy seasons there can be quite brutal as well but we managed we got all the way to south africa in seven months that's almost seven months. That's incredible. And what was? Uh, did you have? To, did you go down by Guinea Guinea Bissau? Did you try and take uh, that yes. road? Oh, that's uh, the worst yes, road did. ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guinea Bissau, especially, is really, really corrupt. So we had uh, one moment did where you have to pull uh, the pull the pull the car across the river on that uh, on that raft thing, or they or they uh, we bridges did, there now. Uh, we had the bridge from Guinea Bissau, but when we came to the Congos between the two Congos, we had to cross the river in a in a small raft. And uh, we were prepared to swim if it would go down because it happens sometimes, <laughs> but it didn't. Well, that's amazing. And, and by the way, shout out to uh, to Mike. Um, Mike is a mutual friend of me and Bjorn, and uh, I met him in Turkey recently. He he does videos where he goes to places like he was in Afghanistan. I was supposed to meet him there, but we didn't get the visa. And he was just in Iraq there with uh, with Bjorn. So shout out to Mike. Uh, go check out his channel, guys. Um, yeah, so uh, just introduce yourself. Don't let me introduce you. Like, what, what you, what's your usual spiel when you when you introduce yourself uh, to show us? Well, my name is Jörn Björn, but that's too hard for people to pronounce, so I go by Björn. Uh, Björn means beer in uh, most Scandinavian languages. So I have my nick online is Vaga Björn, the Vaga bonding beer Björn. Um, I grew up on a small island in Norway, a pretty boring place. So it was a place where nothing was happening. I had to take a boat to school every day. A so at 16, school. yes, um, it was nice, except when it was rough weather. Um, if you miss the boat, then you miss the school day. But I, I moved to Austria when I was 16 years old and stayed one year in Austria. And that's really when the, the travel bug hit me already. 
I explored all the neighboring countries. Um, I failed pretty much all the class, uh, all the courses at high school. <laughs> so I had to repeat it when I came back to Norway. And from the moment I got back to Norway, I felt kind of rootless. Like I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't have my roots only in Norway. So I moved to the US to study there. I studied in, in Costa Rica and in South Africa and used those places as spaces to travel around. And um, I still, I still, uh, my, my parents that took me out to uh, on house exchanges when I was a kid. So we stayed one month in different countries every year. And I've been traveling the same way ever since. So I mostly stay at people's places, uh, not in hotels, not in tourist bubbles. So I really want to see the local life. Like couch surfing or? Yeah, yeah, couch surfing. It could be couch surfing Tinder. It could be meeting people randomly in a bus or a queue, asking if they have a place to stay. Um, it's I do camping uh, a lot, travel with a tent, which is less than one kilo. It's more like a baby bag, kind of like a sleeping bag and a tent in one. So I can put it up on rooftops, in oh, wow. public benches. <laughs> I, I travel quite rough usually. Well, what's that called, the, the tent? It's an outdoor research baby bag. Um, it is rainproof, windproof. It's quite small, so you just have like some space to breathe around your face, and then you're lying in this this bag in a way. So oh, it's just roll it out and get in and uh, try to sleep. Because that kind of ties to a question I got. Um, I fielded in uh, my Facebook group asked a few things, and one of the questions was, "How did you find the time and money to travel every country by 29?" And as you alluded to there. Uh, you don't have to spend too much money. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes, if you would spend one week in every country in the world, all 195 of, five of them, it would take exactly four years. Um, I've spent the majority of my last 13 years on the road. And um, I mean, the time is, is just a matter of priority. I had to prioritize away friends, uh, family at home. I had to prioritize away career, work. So. I had to choose the the low budget option. Uh, I did a lot of hitchhiking. I bought a car and just drove and sold it in another country. And that's something I've done driving uh, five months from Norway to Iraq. Last year, I drove uh, from Norway to Ghana, four months. Um, last year, I did also a couple of months driving around Australia. And next, I mean, this year, I'm starting a 10 month drive from North America to South America. Oh, and this wow. way we can uh, sleep in tents, uh, we can make our own food, we don't pretty much have any other cost than gas. So by traveling this way, um, you don't really need to work more than two, three months in Norway every year. So when I work in Norway thing, now, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a guide, but I've been taking on jobs even in shops and in kindergarten, jobs that I can get, you know, just calling uh, the boss and getting work the next day pretty much, and then leaving after a month or two. So not somewhere where I have to stick around, but just where I can work whenever I want to work. That's pretty amazing. And th that's what a lot of people don't read as well. The money in Norway is serious. I mean, it's probably the most expensive country I've ever been to. <laughs> yeah. the, the salaries are insane. I it think is. My mate was making 25 euros an hour working in a bar there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. plus tips. But then we also have a progressive tax system. So if you work uh, just a few months every year, you might end up paying no or very low taxes. But if you work, you know, full year, you, you're paying close to 50%. So this way I get I to um, just work for a few months and then uh, pay a little tax and yeah, travel, travel the rest. Sounds like a terrible life, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, of course, I'm going to ask, uh, we'll get into each country and stuff like that. But um what do you count as a uh, as a con as a visiting a country like do you need to spend a certain amount of time because you know obviously there's some people i'm sure you're not one of them that just like visit the airport and count it yeah that's absolutely not a count i mean if you're just transiting through a country you don't get any experience of it so you have to stay overnight you have to get some local experiences meet some local people eat some local food um, there are places where I haven't been able to do it, uh, but that's just uh, less than a handful. I mean, I can count on my five fingers. Uh, places like uh, the Vatican, where you're not allowed to stay overnight. And uh, yeah. in my case, uh, Saudi Arabia, actually, I, I only stayed for uh, yeah, like 72 hours in just one city. But 
it's it's uh, it was because of visas or problems that made it not possible to do more. And of course, um, hours those countries right. I'm going back to. Yeah, yeah, it's it's okay. Uh, still, it's a huge country, and I feel a bit like cheating just visiting one city. It's like scratching yeah. off all of Russia after visiting Moscow, which of course I didn't yeah. do. I traveled across the whole country, but um, those countries I I really am going back to um, to spend longer time, see more, except for maybe Vatican and maybe Liechtenstein, where there's not much more to see. Yeah, Liechtenstein you can knock out in a day. Like it's so small. Yeah, the <laughs> the only place of interest for tourists is like a postage stamp museum, and then you have some castles, and it Castle, looks like yeah, just any other, yeah, any other yeah, like uh, uh, yeah. But I, I just learned that you can actually rent the whole of Liechtenstein for for a day if you want to. What you can rent Liechtenstein? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the last <laughs> duchess of, uh, of in the world, so it's like it belongs to one family or something, and uh, it is actually possible. And there was one rapper who who wanted to do it. Um, so yeah, maybe that should be a goal. Wow, and uh, so uh, this this actually goes on to the the next question as well. Like, what's what's the most underrated and overrated countries for you? Like three three either side, would you say? So one really underrated country is Madagascar. Um, you know, my parents were talking about backpacking in South America uh, in their early days, and it seemed like it was kind of rough and very um, not very well developed. And today in the world. All countries are very developed. They're kind of like westernized in some ways, you know, like this cold commercialization. But Madagascar, I found, did not have much of that. Um, to move from A to B, uh, you know, it takes so much time. The roads are very um, bad condition and people are very poor. Um, but this this country is so unique. It's um, It's been isolated uh, from the rest of the world and you'd find some of the like really special wildlife and culture has developed differently from the rest of the world somehow uh when it comes to one, yeah. so when i think of most over it it would be the opposite so it would be like these developed places i mean i don't like to go to new york and london and paris um they are i mean first of all there are so many people traveling there and the people wouldn't care much uh for you as a tourist Whereas if you go to places, you know, like Pakistan, um, as a tourist, people will be welcoming you. Uh, you know, it's something special yeah. for them to receive a guest. And these countries yeah, are uh, like the so, Side note on the Pakistan thing. Uh, I think, Bjorn, how we end up t chatting was uh, you wanted yeah. to visit like, one factory, <laughs> yeah. one factory over there recently. And we had a mutual friend. I put you in touch with the owner of uh, that gun factory. And they're very friendly people. Very, very friendly Thanks. People. Thank you for that. That was an amazing oh, experience. Well. Seeing how yeah, guns are made yeah. by children, handmade, uh, getting to shoot our guns ourselves. You probably, yeah, I saw you did the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They were trying to give me a gun as well. They go, just take one. <laughs> the plane, yeah. you know, I, it's. <laughs> no. No, you can get them work. pretty cheap there. Yeah. yeah, you can. Yeah, you can pick them up pretty cheap. Uh, yeah, I'd say there's, uh, God knows where those guns go. But um, so, so you underrated, you said, uh, you said Madagascar, and yeah. you were talking about overrated a few cities. Is there any other underrated places? You said, yeah, I think absolutely. it was Santau and Principe you mentioned to me. Uh, yeah, oh. absolutely. It's one of the least 10, uh, 10 least visited countries in the world. But yet, it's, it's a stable country. It's safe. It's um, you know very unique as well. They have these uh, volcanic plugs, which are basically just like mountains sticking up. It seems like a, pl a place taken out of Avatar almost. And people are very friendly. It's quite cheap. Um, you get a visa on arrival. It is accessible with flights directly from Europe. So I don't know why why people don't go there. It's a highly underrated country, definitely. Well, you definitely added it to to my list. And um, I think you mentioned where else did you when we were chatting? There was another place that really stuck out uh, that seemed interesting. Oh God, was it Ethiopia? No, it wasn't Ethiopia. Yeah, Ethiopia. Was... It's my favorite country. I've been there four times, yeah. and awesome. I always find new places to go. Um, it's perhaps the most diverse country in the world. You I have, uh, you know, um, ancient uh, sites uh, from like Christianity in the north, east you have the Muslim parts with completely different history in the south is where I like the most. That's where you have like the tribal uh, part in Omo Valley. So there I got to go on some uh, ceremonies like a wedding ceremony called uh, the jumping bull ceremony or something uh, where a man had to jump over seven bulls naked and the what? women were 
whipped uh, bleeding, like euphoric in their eyes, jo jumping up and down. Because the man was supposed to show himself worthy uh, by doing this. You know, if he failed to jump the bulls, he would fail for the marriage. And the women were what? showing how far they would go for the family they got uh, married into. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and it was just what? by coincidence that I met someone who, who took me there at that time. Jesus, seven bulls, man. Do you, how many bulls yeah, yeah, yeah. did you get over? <laughs> yeah, he was like jumping between the bulls, you know, taking steps on them. Uh, yeah, completely naked. Uh, and he managed. Oh, Jesus. That's uh, yeah. that's intense. Yeah, I mean, Ethiopia, I'm always banging on about Ethiopia. It's like one of my top three, like Philippines, Ethiopia, and Colombia are my kind of my, my three at the moment. But I, I'm always encouraging guys to go to Ethiopia. It's just such a fascinating place. And the history yeah. and the, the landscapes and the people and the food. God, I could go on and on about it. It's just a, it's a great place now, I have to say. I've been back back as well and i'll go back again i haven't even been to the south yet because there is so much to explore there yeah exactly yeah the uh, so, so um where where is this overrated is there anywhere that you just you know you've been to every country if i told you now you had to go back to here this country what would be the least mm. favorite where you'd be like oh no not again please uh i'm kind of sorry to say it, but uh i went back to egypt for a couple of months uh, earlier this year and um, you know, you have, for example, Sudan has even more pyramids than Egypt. Yeah. And if you talk to people along the Nile, a lot of them will be just interested in your money. So yeah. one thing is, you know, you can see these amazing pyramids and, you know, learn about this history. But it just, it's like a, it's like a turnoff for me when, when, I, when I don't get connected with the people in the same way as I do in Sudan and Algeria and neighboring countries. Yeah, it's 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 actually it's funny because uh, people ask me that same question. I actually have the same answer. It was uh, yeah. I yeah, believe it or not, um, I wrote about this in my book, but just the constant uh, kind of like trying to wig wiggle get money out of you. It's uh, it gets a bit tiring over there, and uh, it's hot and stuff. Yeah, but compared to the countries around it, it's just uh, it's unfortunate. There there are of course I've uh, met some amazing uh, people from Egypt. Uh, my one of my landlords here in the bar, he. He's a saint, uh, but unfortunately, they've had more experience than anyone because of the pyramids. Uh, mm. With tourism, they've been dealing with tourism for thousands of years. They've generations of skill of of uh, getting some um, what was it called, Bak bakshish, or is that the, uh, the yeah, 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 bribes, uh, so, yeah, tips. Yeah, well, um, there is one place. There is one place in Egypt which I really, really like. It's like close to Mas Marsa Matru, which is by uh -huh. the Libyan border. The culture there is completely different. People have like a more tradition of being nomadic and they have their different way of making tea. Uh, they're so much more hospitable. There's almost no tourists coming. And the beaches are amazing, really like turquoise waters, uh, nice clean sand, and also a place called Siwa Oasis in the middle of the desert. Okay. So there you have these hot springs and palm trees and uh, it's just beautiful. it's just a really beautiful place to be. So there you go. Yes, it's 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 all it's all about nuance. Uh, the, every every place has its has its charms and its uh, its downsides. Well, just got a comment there. Uh, hey, love reading about your travels in your book. So you have a fan there reading. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know it? Hey, Brett. Nice. Uh, well, yeah. you, you wrote you've written a book. I see on your website there. Uh, when was that? Published? I do. Uh, that was in 2019. I went on TV after coming home from visiting every country and I said that I wanted to write a book. So right away there was two publishers who approached me and I went with a local one, uh, wrote a book in a region and then it was later translated to English and now it's also available in Arabic. Oh. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I uh, just sold a couple of thousand copies and I'm writing my second book now. How did you, because like I've written travel books as well, and uh, you, you travel every country. How did you structure it? How did you go about structuring it? Do you mind me asking? Uh, it was very difficult because I wanted to write about every country in the world. But if I did so, it would probably be a couple of thousand pages. So I picked yeah. out 70 countries and wrote short stories, more uh, about lessons I learned, uh, people I meet, like things that made an impression on me. And I also included a lot of pictures. I think that pictures say a lot more than words sometimes um so for my next book i'm going to continue in the same style um just sharing travel stories but then it will be about countries that are not countries ah. because there's still lots of places to, to explore you know if you look at the map here you have this big white spot called greenland for example which is technically a part of uh, denmark 
but it's a completely different experience going there compared to Denmark. So it deserves, it's not a known country, but it deserves uh, uh, to visit for sure. Have you but been? Just like Faroe Islands, Kosovo, Taiwan, they're all they're all not recognized as, uh, as, as countries yeah. themselves. And you got Abkhazia, Nagora Karabakh, South Ossetia, yeah. Transnistria. There's so I'm many places that you love here. Again? Yeah. yeah. Have um, you been to Transnistria? I got, I got arrested twice in six hours there, and I left. It was like, <laughs> this, this, I, this place is just too much. <laughs> I was wearing uh, like camouflage fun. pants, and uh, they said I was impersonating the military. And they go, very corrupt oh, wow. place. Very corrupt oh, place. Wow. <laughs> but good, 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 uh, good vodka, though. Uh, good vodka over there. Um, so we're going to get into the, the little bit of a, I know my audience are just hankering to hear about the women, uh, around the world as well. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. I got it. I got it. Thanks for the super chat, uh, from my nipples hurt when you, you twist them. That just goes to show the <laughs> caliber of my audience compared to you. But, uh, any advice on getting a North Korean flag? So for those guys who don't oh. know what flag is basically like if picking up a girl in North Korea, <laughs> I had some, uh, so I have a chapter in my book called Flirting and Scolding in North Korea. Because uh, oh. I went with a Chinese group. And what happens then is they have a group of 30 people going with one Chinese guide. And I was the only one who wasn't Chinese. So I got my own guide. And she was the oh. same age as me, 26 at the time. And uh, we just walked around um, doing our own thing. So, for example, when the group went to see a toothpaste factory, I said, hey, I'm not interested in seeing a toothpaste factory. So we went to a bar to drink blueberry wine instead. And uh, we got a little bit tipsy. Uh, we got into talking, and uh, I, I swear to God, she was flirting with me. But um, I don't know, staying overnight, um, getting the flag. I haven't figured out that out yet. Um, but I had some <laughs> flirting that was the closest I got. That sounds like a date, man. That sounds like you went on a date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah That's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> pretty drunk. I uh, wish I stayed longer, and uh, but it was quite interesting just talking to her, you know, about life and. You know, sometimes you ask these questions very direct and you can tell that she's like not telling the truth, but joking about it because she was quite tipsy too. And like, hey, do you believe that Kim Young really went to the moon and back, you know, on a day? It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. And of course, you know, that's or she knows that it's bullshit as well. So, yeah, I, I guess there's yeah. some sort of filter in their head where they have to kind of like, you know, they have to, they have to watch what they say. Yeah. But did you feel like you're being watched over there, uh, surveilled? Oh, yeah, yes and no. Um, I actually managed to leave even my guide for a bit. I went to this uh, kind of fun park, which was closed down. It looked like a really like Soviet, you know, you know, like Chernobyl, just abandoned. So I went there and took some pictures. And then uh, a military guy came shouting at me. And I, I wasn't the one who got into trouble. It was more my guide. And I just had to promise that I wouldn't uh, get away from the group again. I just told him I'm going to a bathroom when we were at the restaurant and I went wandering off. But um, yeah, I didn't I didn't get into trouble, really. Um, you you are with guide at, at all times. You're at least you're supposed to. But I know people who have been out, you know, going for jogs by themselves and so. But people don't speak English, so you can't really talk to people or do much by yourself, I guess. So Did you spend it's more a country. There? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I used the US dollars. I went to, for example, a liquor store and bought uh, mushroom. Uh, I, there was mushroom uh, spirits and there was also hemp spirits because, you know, weed is uh, legal there. So they have all these kind of like oh, weed products. Yeah. Really? The problem is just you you can't bring it back to China. So I couldn't. Yeah, well, uh, definitely not. But you can smoke weed legally in North Korea? Apparently you can do. I heard that even police do it, but I didn't. I didn't see people smoking, but I saw you know weed products being sold in the shops. Um, that's my experience. Oh, that's cool. And I, I got a really good question uh, leading on because I want to know about this region. It's the only region I haven't traveled to, and it's Oceania. Um, any favorites from Oceania? The island countries like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Ooh, Palau. Absolutely, uh, Vanuatu is definitely one. I um, went to an island called Tana, which has an active volcano where you really see the lava shooting above your head. So it's oh, kind of wow. scary. You feel the ground shaking and everything. Even the guy I was with, we just snuck up instead of paying for the entrance. And he was, was scared. He wanted to run down. Um, but I went up again at night. Uh, you know, it's such, such a beautiful place. So I stayed there in his village for a week. And uh, I didn't get the place to charge my phone. So I didn't really know what time my flight went back. So when I came to the airport, the the people there told me that actually the flight went yesterday. 
And I was like, shit, you know, this was a tiny, tiny <laughs> airport in a small uh, island. Uh, but then they said, you know, there's a plane taking off uh, from the runway. So just run out there and ask them. And I saw this small propeller plane, you know, about to take off. And I said, hey, please, can I join you? And I said, yeah, hop on. Uh, so I hitchhiked with a plane back to uh, the capital or the main island. Oh, man. It, it was really an uh, amazing uh, place. I, I stayed with the mayor of Tana Island. And this was right after Cyclone Pam. So it was like a lot of destruction. Um, but it, it was really, really a fascinating place. You have people, you know, living without clothes, pretty much living without money on this island called Tana. There's actually a Hollywood movie made called uh, Tana, which I didn't watch yet, but I heard that, you know, this this culture is changing fast. But 10 years ago, it was like really, really uh, real, uh, I felt in a way. And yeah, uh, Tonga, actually one of my favorite travel experiences from Tonga. I'll have to unbutton my shirt for this because I, I had the tattoo made here. I was swimming with humpback whales. And this is one of the few places in the world where you can do that. Um, wow. So I just went with the captain, hopped out, and I was swimming with these huge animals that are the size of an airplane. And you hear them kind of singing. Wow. And uh, since Tonga is also the place where tattoos were invented, I had to get oh. it uh, on my chest, you know. Wow. So, so Tonga, cool. absolutely. Um, Tuvalu is pretty funny as well. It's just like one strip. So the whole country is like everything that happens in Tuvalu happens on the airstrip. That's where they do their yoga, their football, you know, everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they have a prison there, which is just a shack where people can, he can come and go as he pleases. Uh, I met the, the only person from Tuvalu who had been to the world or championships of weightlifting. So he was like the national hero. So he was drinking with the weightlifting championship uh, champion, which was good fun. And I went to this marine conservation park just by asking a fisherman to take me there which has some of the most beautiful beaches I've, I've seen in my life. So it's really an interesting place. And uh, I'm curious, what's Papua New Guinea like? Well, it's pretty, <laughs> um, I think it's also one of the most diverse countries in the world. Um, the problem, which I didn't know at the time, is that there's no roads leading to the capital. So it's yeah. just uh, shattered out on different islands. Um, so I came there just on a one-way ticket. I stayed with some people who were working in the mines. And uh, they had their own security and everything. But after two days, I said, I can't stay with them anymore. They were going on a work trip, so I was by myself. So what I did then was just to go down to the harbor, and I asked the fisherman if I could come stay in his, his place. And said, OK, you can stay here for a week. Uh, if you just come with us, go fishing. So I was eating lobster every morning and going uh, spear fishing at, uh, in the nights. Oh, nice. But it's it's really one of the countries I want to go back to. And I was on my way to Papua New Guinea in the moment when the whole world went into lockdown in uh, March last year. So it's like a super tribal country, but you won't see any of that in this in the capital unless you are there on the national day, which I was, where all the tribes come to the city and show oh. off their dancing and stuff. So you know, That's you have people dancing with with horns on their penises and you know like really a lot of like naked people painted and you know screaming like really warrior like uh stuff so it's oh, pretty cool cool place yeah i'm really interested to go there because i know there's no road so but there's there's you can actually walk from north to south there's the coco coco brite trail or, some, or it's coco mo trail yeah. or something like that it takes like 10 days you walk from, you go from Port Moresby up to the, I think you end up in Ley or somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard yeah. about that. Um, Seems like an adventure. The place, I wanted, the place I wanted to visit this time was a place called Bougainville. And yes. they had their referendum last year, I think. And yeah, they voted for yeah. yes, like 98%. New so country, yeah. Since, yeah, it's going to be a new country. Um, yeah. I guess they're applying for UN membership. But uh, for the moment, they have their own borders. It's quite different from the rest of uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, I heard from people that they love uh, heavy metal there, especially Norwegian heavy metal. And oh, they're, yeah. you know, they're all like completely black, uh, different from the rest of the country. And uh, all right. actually, you know, the story of Avatar, it was taken yes. from there because really? they opened one of the biggest copper mines in the world, an Australian company. And then the, the people went, you know, kicking the company out. Uh, so there was like a boycott from the rest of the world. So they were basically like this island, which had to be self-sufficient. So they made their own medicines, they made their own weapons, and a lot of it was made from coconut. That's why they call it the coconut revolution. So they were basically, you know, making spears and guns, shooting down planes even, uh, with homemade weapons, fighting against, you know, modern uh, 
modern uh, tools and weapons. Oh, wow. Man. This yeah, is real life so uh, avatar. Like Dude, I had to go for a point with you. I feel like I could talk to you for hours about just asking about all these different places. You seem to you, you got some it. incredible stories. Yeah, yeah, we will. Like, I, I plan on going to Iraq later this year. Yeah. I was gonna, try, I was gonna, I was gonna try to do it last month, but it didn't work out. Um, I'll be there in I'll, September again to do another September. trip. Yeah. Okay, September could work. September could work. I just my main focus now is getting my sailboat back to to Malta. I'm struggling with the mechanic. But uh, yeah. yeah, but but I'm gonna do some traveling uh, later on in the year. So maybe 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 we can meet up in Baghdad for a point because I hear the bars are open. I, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. The nightlife there. I'll take you to a place called uh, Taco. Um, maybe uh, Mike he knows the place. We went there for. He recommended that place. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and you know you can find bars with girls short short skirts. Baghdad has everything. It's a city of 10 million people, second biggest Arab city in the world. So yeah, yeah so we'll we'll have fun. <laughs> yeah no, uh the, the, all right and uh <laughs> yeah there's so many so many so many places uh i i'm curious because uh when i, I visit i visited my 100 country when i was 30 years old right and i remember thinking yeah. i can kind of slow down i don't want to visit every country too fast because um i'm worried that if i travel to every country i'll be like oh no what next did you have any sort of um did you have any sort of like anticlimactic feeling when you finished your goal at 29 of visiting every country? Did you feel like, oh, this is my, you know, you're at the top of a mountain, top of Everest. And did you feel like, what am I going to do now? Did you have any sort of uh, struggle Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. I got depressed. I did. Uh, you know, I've been working 10 years on that single goal, you know, sacrificing so much. And then I was sitting there on a beach in Seychelles and I was out of countries. It, it was really, uh, it was an anticlimax. I mean, I had been enjoying it so much uh, the way there and I, I just wanted it to continue, um, but there was empty of countries. But then it just took a few days and yeah, I realized that there was so much more to see. Uh, there's so many places I wanna go back to. I wanna show other people uh, countries as, as well, which is why I'm arranging tours since then. So uh, I, I definitely got my motivation back and I'm traveling just as much as I did, so. Yeah, all is good now. That's good because uh, I know that you know you've met Johnny Ward, um, one step forward. He's a he's an Irish yeah. guy. He, he traveled every country as well, and now he's he rode across the Atlantic, and now he's climbing climbing every all the seven summits. So he's yeah. so, I, and he wrote about having that issue as well when he traveled every country. He kind of got depressed for a year. He didn't know what to redo with himself, and now he's climbing mountains and stuff like that. Um. But it's no, it's 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 interesting to hear that you know there's yeah you, you get over it because I, I was a bit worried about it but now it's uh, now I'm like ah you know maybe maybe I could speed up a little bit because we could die tomorrow so yeah exactly I mean there's lots of goals which you know you might not have time in your lifetime even you know if, if you want to land the flag in every country I mean with girls and everything that's gonna be a lifetime uh, goal. I mean, you can always set yourself new goals and uh, you can still travel in the same way you did. And, uh, you know, actually, it's more like having a buffet. You're tasting a little bit of each and then afterwards, you know, really what you want to dig into. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> go for the lobster after, or, you know, so. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm all good now. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my flagging days are behind me now. I stopped that one <laughs> late, late, late. 20s. Yeah, I was. I was curious about that. You're married and. Uh, it's congratulations by the way no problem yeah for those guys who don't know i got <laughs> uh, on the 11th of june i got hitched so yeah on my my flagging days are behind me but um yeah i was uh, when i was in my late 20s i stopped that for ego purposes because i was i was realizing i was just kind of doing it i was kind of like a performance monkey from my blog and stuff like that but uh, no, I still, I still, I still go out on ventures with the boys and uh, still do plenty of travel. And yeah, I think you know, um, but I want to start a family soon, so uh, it's going to be hard to juggle that when kids come along. But um, I, I'm making it my intention to uh, to uh, to keep on traveling and keep adventuring. But I, I have another question here. He's like, no, any episode where he says whipped, yes. <laughs> I I needed you have to, you have to give me some stick about it because. Uh, uh, I, I, I railed against marriage in my early 20s, but I feel a bit differently about it now. Guys, if you're ever going to do it, make sure you get a prenup and yada, yada, <laughs> yada. 
Um, but only there's no point doing it unless you're having plan having kids. I'm 35. I want to. I want to have a family. Um, anyway, what country? Where, where, where? What was the country where you felt most unsafe? This is a question by Find the Formula. Yeah, actually, the first time I ever felt unsafe was probably at my 80th country or something when I went to Papua New Guinea. Um, the time when I just I, I couldn't afford spending $200 a night for a hotel, which is pretty much the only options. And I went to this fisherman. Um, but at the, there, I felt like it was quite tense um, that uh, people were sharing stories about locals who went with machetes. I mean, you saw them walking with machetes, and, you know, chopping off arms and, and these things. Um, what I think is the most unsafe countries are the countries where the government has the least control. So when you're talking about North Korea, for example, I find it to be one of the safest countries in the world because the government has total control. Same thing with uh, Algeria. Uh, Algeria has, actually has the most, the second most amount of policemen uh, compared to the population. But um, the ones that have the least control would be Central African Republic. Um, yeah. It would be places, you know, that are at, at war. If you go to Syria, like I did in 2018, I saw some bombs going off. You know, things can change fast. Um, if you look at Afghanistan at the moment, also, you know, they're, the government is losing more and more control. The Taliban is taking over huge areas. Um, so, so definitely uh, those countries. I'll have to look at my map, actually. Uh, but, you know, uh, Congo, <laughs> Congo, Nigeria, yeah. oh fuck, I was, I was in Nigeria, Nigeria. I didn't know, oh, I didn't know what was happening around me, but exactly. we were driving this car uh, through the whole uh, of West Africa, and uh, there was one place in Ibeokuta, it's a city, mm -hmm. where there was this kind of festival going on, and people advised us to stay in the compound where we had pitched tents uh, outside mm -hmm. a hotel. But I wanted to see um, the place, so I went outside, and I was dragged into this like huge event with thousands of people, and they pushed me to the front, um, where there was a man sitting on the table, you know, reading a a book. I guess, I'm, I'm guessing maybe Quran or something. And uh, whenever whenever he was standing up, everyone put up their guns in the air and started shooting. Oh my so God. I was like expecting this to be like, okay, this might be like a military group or I, I, I actually didn't know what was happening, but it was pretty, pretty crazy. But everyone were friendly, um, you know, just, just like in rest of West Africa, you have a lot of people asking, hey, buy me a Coke, buy me a chicken, stuff like this. Yeah. But uh, when you get to know them, when you get to talk to them, they're actually really nice. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I found uh, Mogadishu pretty ropey and uh, <laughs> I can imagine. Mogadishu yeah uh, have you been to Mogadishu I haven't uh but I hosted oh. a guy from Somalia the last days and he promised that he will take me there not on a tour but just to stay with locals and uh yeah, yeah see a it's bit intense, of the real man. life it's intense uh I did a documentary over there uh I had to take it down from uh YouTube I think the last episode's up there but it was a suicide like I I I got some footage of a suicide bot uh suicide bomber's head. He blew himself up in the restaurant we were on our way to when we arrived. His head was there with his brains out and his body everywhere. And I got it all on video. But it was uh wow. it was pretty tense stuff over there. Um yeah, it's Somalia, that part of Somalia anyway, and uh eastern Congo, like Goma. Have you ever been to the eastern part? Or just you've been to Kinshasa? No, just the west. Goma Goma's pretty intense as well. You got a lot of uh, you got the LRA. You got a lot of uh, illegal mining up there. It's, I, when we went, there was 25 different groups fighting in the jungles over there. And you've all the, the people left over from the Hutus. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of bad people. They call, I think it's like the rape capital of the world is Goma or something like that. And I mean, Papua New Guinea is pretty bad for that as well. Yeah, it sounds lovely. Yeah. yeah. They but put a, one thing is actually like the places where things have happened have not been the places where I really felt unsafe. It's more the opposite, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, actually, the few times I got mugged was in the US and one time in Ukraine where I was beat up pretty bad and uh, one time in Cameroon. And, you know, Cameroon is not really a dangerous place. You can go to the north and so where there's like some military groups controlling. But it's like it's a lot of crime happening still. So I was coming from Nigeria. I uh, couldn't leave my place at the night, even though I had uh, malaria because it was like a bit dangerous. But once we crossed into Cameroon, I hopped in a taxi to go to the hospital with my malaria. And what happened on the way to the hospital was that a group of eight, nine people, they stopped our car. And first two ones were running, opening the doors. And then the second one just went to grab the stuff. And then um, the other ones came to help. 
So when I saw my friend's stuff getting pulled out of the car, I just held on to my backpack. I was dragged out of the taxi with my backpack, you know, like weak with malaria, but suddenly I got a lot of strength. So I was really fighting him, like punching him in the face and everything uh, because I had my passport, my car drive, computer, everything I owned yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, what happened was that his friend came from the other side of the car with a massive knife and stabbed me in the hand. So I still have this oh. scar on my hand here. And um, oh, and uh, I came to the hospital with no password, no money. And the people there wouldn't treat me for the stabbing wound or for the malaria. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just um, unlucky. It was not in a really dangerous country, but uh, yeah, I was like dying there and they wouldn't help me because I didn't have cash. But then luckily I had some friends who came to the hospital with some money and uh, went went all, all, all well. Oh, wow. That's intense. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if the malaria wasn't bad enough, some guy stabbing you doesn't help. <laughs> no, exactly. It's pretty, like, is there any other, that's, there's a, yeah, someone's reading, I think it said in your book. Yeah, it was Cameroon. Yeah, that was, uh, the, uh, so, uh, I mean, you said you got beat up in by the police in Ukraine as well. No, actually, that was um, that was some just some guys. Um, oh, okay. I didn't I didn't know about this whole East West thing. You've probably been and noticed how it's like very tense, just like Israel Palestine, you know, like uh, okay. Azerbaijan Armenia. So basically, I met these girls at a nightclub, and they asked, "Hey, can uh -huh. you help us get in?" And you know, these girls are really beautiful. I uh, I took them in and uh, asked, uh, "Where are we from?" And it said uh, Russia. And uh, actually, when I asked more, they were from Donetsk, which, but they considered themselves Russians. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So basically, the people in Lvov, where I was, they really didn't like Russians. So when they found out yeah. that I had been helping these uh, people to get into the bar, um, they followed me in the streets and just beat me up, took my money, came back to the hostel, just bleeding uh, in the snow. Yeah. But it, it was just money. I didn't carry yeah, I don't yeah. I never carry much on me anyway, so Yeah, yeah. I I had I got jumped on uh, by four guys in Haiti once. It just it was just after the earthquake. <laughs> and that was a pretty that was a pretty terrifying experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hate hate is pretty rough too. It is. Yeah, it's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. And I like where do you, have you ever felt anywhere that you that people didn't like you? Like uh that you kind of got some sort of uh Yeah. Uh, I had that maybe the first time in Somaliland. Um, I came in wearing shorts and, you know, I have tattoos showing. So people came and someone pushed me, like someone even hit, went by the car and hit me through the window of the car and, you know, shouting haram and stuff like this. So I got into my host. He was a Syrian guy who had escaped from the war and staying in, um, in uh, where was it, Hargeza. And he told me, like, you can't, you can't wear shorts here. You can't just show off your tattoos like that. You're, I had earrings, you know, like these gauges, big plugs. And as soon as I changed, went out, people were super friendly. But uh, yeah, I heard stories of people being see, changed yeah, yeah. with sticks and rocks and everything just by having tattoos and stuff. So it's quite conservative there. Yeah, in Somalia, in Mogadishu, I got reprimanded for earrings. Uh, yeah, because it's apparently a taram. I didn't know it's a taram, but <laughs> yeah. I, still, I still kept them in there. I was like, ah, oh, screw you. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, so, so Somaliland was one place uh, anywhere else that did you ever feel anywhere that they kind of like were a bit racist or xenophobic uh i'm sure there could be some places uh racist i was staying i was living in south africa for a while and i had some experience with you know taxi driver who didn't want to take me and stuff like this but uh, not really actually i was in johannesburg one night i was partying and i told uh, someone that i've been to like 160 countries and then there was uh, someone who said, oh, hey, you have to come to a place. You know, I have to come to this uh, after party, which was at the top, you know, a suite of a hotel. And I came up and there was the grandson of, of Nelson Mandela and grandson of uh, wow. Desmond Tutu. So cool. they were just like, hey, or just order what you want to eat from the reception. And, you know, they had Grey Goose and like all the drinks. Um, they were just flying around their private planes, having fun. And uh, he was just telling me how he loved uh you know zimbabwe was his name mugabe the way he'd been like yeah. trying to hit the reset button by starving people so that they would move out from the uh, cities and start farming the land and become you know like the breadbasket of africa again so like his comments was a little bit like uh you know like kind of africa unite in a way and um not that he had anything against me but he was like 
yeah, a little bit racist and, uh, you know, I got like these white people ruling our country and stuff like this. Yeah, I get you. I get you. I get, and, but on to more, a lighter topic, where, in your opinion, this is the big question that everyone's been waiting for. But, but uh, girls. Question, but here, yeah, where's your, where do you think is the most beautiful women in the world? You've been to every single country. Whereabouts? For you, yeah, top so, three. Let's give a top three. I think for me, uh, number one would be Kazakhstan. Uh, you know, oh, if you go to the nightclubs nice there, you have a beautiful mix of Russian and kind of Asian. And mm -hmm. Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, they actually have a lot of Koreans. So what they did, I think, during the Second World War was they moved, you know, a whole population to in the middle of nowhere, which was in Kazakhstan. And these people, you know, getting their beautiful babies with the Russians, you know, tall Asians, uh, really like they have a character also their you know, their pers personality. So going out in the bars there, seeing these girls in high skirts, uh, that's that's number one. Made you crazy. I was there last year. At those two places, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Uh, yeah, yeah there, there's there's a good mix there, and uh, they this, the nightlife there is really good. It's like it six is, in the is. morning. You can party. You, they know how to party over there. Yeah, there's, there's uh, lots of there. Kazakh oligarchs, you know, with lots of money just throwing mm -hmm. around. And when I came there, it was it was some you know really rich dudes who wanted to have a VIP table, you know, just bringing the bottles and. We had we had good fun. I had similar experiences in like Lebanon, and uh, yeah, just where you just come across these rich people who just want to like just get lots of ladies and lots of drinks and show you a good time. Oh, that's amazing! So Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, they're your your top pick. Is there is there two other kind of uh, ones you, or regions that you you're fond of? Um, I'd say maybe Ukraine and Belarus. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 kind yeah. of standard. My, mine would be that as well. Ukraine and Belarus yeah. are just absolutely gorgeous, ridiculous over there. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a, there's a consensus of it for a lot of well traveled guys. I always hear those, I always hear Ukraine. It's and, and Belarus. good nightlife, you know, it's cheap yeah. and it's mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah, they're very, very attractive and educated as well. Same with Kazakhstan, the former Soviet Union places, all of them like uh. Uh, Armenia, Georgia, all those places. They're, they're, they're very educated people. They're smart, you know, mm -hmm. and they have good values as well. Uh, yeah. So, um, where where is the ugliest? The ugliest, the ugliest woman. Oh man. Uh, I don't know. Like you can actually find like some of the ugliest also in Kyrgyzstan. You have like these Turkic yeah. uh, nomadic people who are yeah. quite uh, like fat and like round in their faces, uh, yeah. living like nomads. So if you go to like Mongolia and. Uh, you know, follow the nomadic lines there. Some, you know, it's it's a hit or miss. But yeah. uh, you can also, I guess, like anywhere where there's just short and fat, like if they had the bad, you know, uh, food there and, uh, you know, Pacific people are super, super lazy. They like Sundays, they wouldn't yeah. even touch a button on their phone. Like they're just supposed to be sleeping and eating the whole time. So that brings, you know, some of the unhealthiest people in the world and you can see it in yeah. the, the way the women look as well. Yeah, the the Pacific Islands. Uh, I think um, they have the highest obesity rates in the world. And uh, another another group aren't particularly nice. Are Aboriginal Australians like they were yeah. very attractive? <laughs> Not always. No, we're being so yeah. mean. We're being so bitchy. Yeah. Okay. We should. Yeah, we should stop that. <laughs> no, it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm bringing out the worst in you. But uh, the yeah. So um, I have uh, I have another question here. Should I should read these questions before you look some. Oh, yeah. What are some tips uh, to traveling alone? Shout out mm. to from a Peruvian currently in Barcelona. Okay, Mats, man. Yeah, so I have been traveling mostly alone. I don't want to wait for someone to get to want to go to the same place and, you know, travel on their terms. So I go by myself, but still I never am alone. So what I do is just to be open to other people, try to meet people, go to hostels where you can meet people, uh, you know, talk to people while, while you're waiting somewhere. Um, you know, even when I wasn't small, I wasn't smoking, but I would carry cigarettes and just always offer to people next to me and like, have this, like have this bond, bonding experience Pro tip, guys. and, you know, Pro tip. it ends, end up with you staying with him at his place and, you know, like him showing you places and so on. So really, if you get to know the people living there, uh, it opens up so much more experiences that you would have gotten if you were just staying by yourself. Wow. That, you know, that's it. And I, I always encourage, uh, guys, I, Personally, prefer traveling with friends, but you should never wait for your friends. Just book the tickets. If people want to join, they can join. But it's such an amazing experience when you travel alone. You learn a lot about yourself. 
you get outside your comfort zone. It's it's it can be it can be very um uh what's the word I'm looking for? Uh cathartic experience. No, that's not the word. Mm. But it, it it can be life changing, I would say. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And do you how are you with languages? Do you do you pick up any languages when you're traveling or do you learn a few words or it's just too many uh, I speak to uh, I speak five languages from living in places and learning from school. Um, but then when I travel, I try to just learn phrases. So anything you can like, if you can fill a A5 page, uh, A4 page with, you know, just some phrases, you'll see that you can use those in so many times, like, especially of course, like, thank you and no one, uh, you know, counting these things. But uh, it's like, if you learn 1% of the language, maybe you could use it in 50% of the situations. So uh, definitely learn learn some some words, some phrases, uh, and of course body language. Body language always works. Yes. Do you, do you have uh, speaking of body language? Like, have you ever have you ever traveled where you didn't speak any of the local language and you met a girl and you guys just kind of hit it off just through? <laughs> and... Yeah. Well, Madagascar, I had one. I didn't speak French at that time. Uh, there was actually two girls coming up to me and asking, like, which one do you like better? So <laughs> that's also why, you know, Madagascar is highly underrated. It's, ah, it's Africa. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. I've had, I've had wow. similar experiences like that where um, I remember I was in Liberia and uh, there was a, there was a girl and she came up and another girl came up and was like I'm better looking and then the other girl got her friend and it was like now there's two of us then the other girl got her friend and it was like now there's two of us which two do you like <laughs> so it's pretty yeah it's, Liberia it's, it's, yeah the, that's an Only. interesting place uh, yeah so guys um, guys have no idea what the world is like when you get out there. Just there's some places that you can just have incredible experiences and it gets pretty crazy. I mean, as you as you guys have heard, just you've only gotten snippets uh, from Bjorg's uh, repertoire, uh, but you should definitely buy his book. I'm sure there's loads of great stories in there. What's your plans for the future, man? Well, um, I am organizing trips for people. So, you know, last week I was in Baghdad uh, in Iraq uh, for a week. I had 10 Americans, two British, and just wanted to see, or actually wanted to show them the highlights of the country. So actually that, that makes a lot of, it's quite meaningful to me. I mean, I've seen it from before, but just seeing other people going to the same places and seeing them with new eyes and, uh, you know, opening up the eyes for places that have maybe a bad image, you know, like Mike going to these no-go zones and seeing that actually there's um, it's quite all right you know like it's iraq is so rich in history and culture and tradition and uh, you know you just have to go there to really realize it to understand it so i'm doing this tours i'm writing a book and visiting countries that are not countries so next week i'll go to transnistria again i will go to uh, you know i want to go to south ossetia and gorno karabakh countries that are not recognized as countries, but still different uh, from others, you know, having your own passwords, own currencies, own languages and borders. So still traveling, discovering new places, going back to some of my favorite places. That's amazing, man. And uh, so we're, we're getting close to an hour now. Is there any, is there any kind of messages you want to, or advice you want to dish out to guys who are, let's say, watching this, who maybe aren't so well traveled uh, most of my audience are american uh maybe they've just been you know once to europe or uh you know they've they've kept it relatively safe is there anything advice or any any advice you give them yeah so the title of my book is go discover the world might be different than you think and uh really just try not to to get too much about like if you listen too much to other people how you know get an impression before you go there it might ruin it's if you just go and talk to people, you'll see that it might be very, very different. You know, going to Pakistan, I'm sure you had like the best, the most hospital experiences and seeing these beautiful places that you, you don't hear about in the news. So really like leave behind stereotypes and go and make up your own mind, your own judgment about the place. Um, that's really one. And one thing I, I, I would encourage people to do is not to plan too much ahead. Like if you are planning too much, uh, you're leaving out uh, this flexibility, which has 
which gives you the opportunities to have a really good travel experience. So I go by one-way tickets mostly, and uh, you know, like my experience in Pakistan, I had things I wanted to see, but then on the plane I met a guy who was gonna have a, a wedding, so I just went a completely different way and hang, was hanging out with him. Uh, I got to know his friends who took me around another place, and you know, just going with the flow, with the wind at the moment instead of staying on itinerary and missing out on these things. And that's that's a, a big thing about traveling alone because you can uh, you can do that stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Like well, if you're with friends, you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna get into those situations. You're not gonna be as flexible. Maybe they want to do something else, but you really can just go with the flow. Yeah, exactly. I've got a, some questions on Facebook here. Uh, I think we've covered most of them. What lessons? Did you, what lesson did you learn from traveling every country in the world? Is there any well, lesson? <laughs> Uh, actually, you know that I, I, I'm so glad that I visit every country because every single country are different in some ways. Um, it's, it's incredible how borders just transform a country, you know, it's language, currency, you know, politics, uh, all based on maybe who was ruling them in the past. You know, you go from Nigeria, which was British, to Cameroon, which was French, and you see, okay, the, the bread changes uh, based on that and everything changes. So I really like, it opened my eyes of the diversity of this world somehow. And um, I've, I've definitely gotten more naive. Actually, I've been criticized a lot for being naive and reckless on my travels. I had an interview in Kabul with a press agency uh, that ended up as an article in almost 100 newspapers around the world, different languages. So the headline there was naive, reckless tourist couch surfing in war-torn nation. And this was an interview oh, where I was talking about that. the yeah oh, I yeah, read yeah, about that. yeah yeah ridiculous. I knew I recognized your face from somewhere. Yeah, so I actually had a whole TED talk here in Stavanger about uh, about this uh, experience, like just explaining it from my uh, my view. And uh, actually, my naiv naivety, can you say I guess, yeah. is like my key to actually getting to know the places and the people wherever I go and like the experiences. So the fact that I was I met a girl in a taxi in Syria. Uh, who I stayed with, with in a week in, a, in Damascus and ended up traveling around Syria with her um, during you know the times of 2018 was all the two thanks that I was actually a bit naive and trusting this woman. But I think I've, I've developed somehow a little bit of a gut feeling for people. I've jumped into taxis where I shouldn't have gotten into and the next time you, maybe you don't. Yeah, taxi drivers is always the worst. They're yeah. like- <laughs> The scum. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you never, never judge a country by its taxi drivers because you know yeah, it's, it's just everywhere. You're, you I know, mean, they're, they're... traveling teaches you something that you can't learn in school. You know, even going to market and asking for the price of bananas, and you can kind of like tell if he's not even knowing what the currency, well, how much is worth, but the telling how how he presents it. If he hesitates when he's giving you price, a man who sells bananas all day, of course, he knows the price of the bananas. So you know these kind of like instinctive things you that you can learn from travel i think it's really important because i think we forget about in in our modern society somehow yeah how old are you now 31. oh you're only 31. oh god man i'm jealous i am jealous yeah you, you make you make you make uh, you really make the i'm sure you're going to expire a ton of guys um for who are watching this like every country by 29 well done that, like well done that's super super cool and uh, I think you're, you're going to have just, you got an amazing life ahead of you. I mean, well, like, what else are you going to do? What else are you going to shoot? Do you have any other, do you have any other kind of like goals outside of traveling? And uh, now that you have kind of, I guess, uh, yes. the planet so that way. When Corona hit and I couldn't travel so all of a sudden, I bought a couple of apartments, did some refurbishments. I bought some land farming food. But then I have friends here who take care of it when I travel. And it's actually freed up my time. I thought it would kind of make me they have to stay here, but it actually gives me more freedom. It actually gives me a little bit of an income on, on the road. So I always have a, you know, a backup now if things go wrong, if I get tired of it all, I can always just go back to here and work as a guide or whatever job, like live a simple life. So you have, um, you I guess so at the moment, oh. no, <laughs> I, I actually work in a kindergarten a little bit now and uh, I work five hours a day and that's enough with the kids. It's, yeah. it's a lot of work. All right, so so you wouldn't uh, 
you, you're, you have no intention at the moment of uh, at the of moment no. Yeah. Yeah. But if let's say if you were let's say forty, right, and you're you're kind of you're kind of done with the, the travel and, and adventuring, uh, if you had to like pick a country where, all right, I'm thinking about maybe getting a partner. Uh, mm-hmm. Where would you where where would you be looking on the map to pick uh, to pick out a wife? Or, or not a, wife, a mother, a mother of the yeah, sure, why not? If you got to convert to Islam, get 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 ten of them in the backyard in Nigeria, mm-hmm. why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> I would definitely think about climate. So I would have one in either Norway or Switzerland or somewhere where it's good money, and then I would have yeah. a second one maybe in the southern hemisphere, um, uh-huh. maybe Uruguay or I don't know, like somewhere beautiful. I was also thinking of maybe somewhere hot where you can stay in the winter, like Philippines, Thailand, play, places like life is where life is easy people don't have any worries there and i just love being among the people and just enjoying enjoying life which not everyone managed to do here in, in the same way yeah man philippines is, is so is so cool I, I always thought like ah, if i got to a certain if I, if I didn't choose the path i'm on now where i'm settled in malta if i ended up you know 40 50 and i'm still single i'd be like philippines let's go <laughs> yes yeah. Where, where have you had the most fun with with the chicas well okay let me think now uh it's a difficult question uh maybe you know living in, in central america studying there it was going out all the time and yeah. just meeting people having fun oh it was good it's good times in with costa rica you were living in right? that was in costa rica yeah. oh awesome all right, man. Uh, unless we'll take, do I have any more questions here? But but that uh, I don't, guys. Last chance for any questions. You have thirty seconds. But if not, um, <laughs> um, we can we can do. Uh, yeah, your snooze. <laughs> uh, we can do a sign off. So where can people find you? How can they follow you? All that jazz. So online, my name is Vaga Bjorn. A mix of vagabond and Bjorn, which means beer. Uh, I am starting now a new webpage called vagaclub.com. So really what I want is for people to get together to explore places that they might not visit uh, by themselves. Um, I want to be drifting around. So I got two cars in Canada that I'm going to be driving for 10 months, uh, you know, doing these multi-month road trips because I believe that's the freest life that you can have. So if anyone wants to join me there, vagaclub.com or vagabjorn.com. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to have any, anyone on board. Oh, that's amazing, man. And you guys know my spiel, NaughtyNomad.com. Follow me at NaughtyNomad, yada, yada, yada. But, but I'm not the star of the show today. <laughs> I'm not the star <laughs> of the show today. Listen, man, uh, an absolute pleasure. Great having you on. And hopefully we can meet for a point in uh, in Baghdad. Yes, let's do that. All right. We'll awesome, make a plan. Man. Take, take care, guys. And uh, thank you for all your questions. Uh, and hope you enjoyed the show. And... Uh, Catch you later. I'll see you, man. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.